Uh, good morning. I'd like to uh, welcome you all to uh, this session, uh, the title of which is Energy, the Arab Awakening, a view from Riyadh. I never thought there was anybody asleep, but uh, I uh, think this is going to be a very interesting panel. My name is Henry Lee. I'm on the faculty here at the Kennedy School, and I also direct the uh, Environment and Natural Resource Program here. Uh, we have a number of very interesting speakers on a topic that I think is, uh, has been important for 30 years and will become even increasingly important uh, in the decades ahead. Uh, I think as you all know, uh, Saudi Arabia is the largest oil producer in the world. Uh, it sits on about one-fifth of the oil, uh, proven oil reserves or resources. Uh, it also is the fifth largest gas producer in the world. But there are three, uh, I think, critical changes uh, that I think are very worth watching. Uh, first is that uh, last year, uh, Saudi Arabia produced about 11.5 million barrels a day. Uh, they exported 8.6, but they consumed 2.7 million barrels. And the consumption level is continuing to grow. Uh, and so one of the interesting issues, if you ask where in the world is oil demand increasing <coughs> rapidly, it is in the Middle East and it's particularly in Saudi Arabia. Uh, second is that um, last year 54% of uh, Saudi Arabia's oil production <coughs> was exported to uh, the uh, Far East. Uh, and that trend is likely to continue, and so the direction of trade is changing dramatically. And the third is that uh, the Saudi Arabian <coughs> government budget has been increasing, and oil is a major uh, source of the money to support uh, that budget, um, which limits the flexibility that Saudi Arabia has historically always had. To talk about uh, oil gas and energy in Saudi Arabia. We've got three terrific speakers here this morning. Uh, Dr. Muhammad Al-Saban is a professor at the King Abdulaziz University. He's the former advisor to the Saudi Minister of Petroleum and Mineral Resources. He's the former chief climate negotiator for Saudi Arabia. And he sits on the economic advisory panel of the Saudi Supreme Economic Council. He has a doctorate from the University of Colorado. He will be followed by Mr. Ali Shahabi. He's the founder of the Rasmala Investment Bank. He has written extensively on a number of issues, including the Arab-Israeli conflict and the Arab-Iranian <coughs> tensions. He sits on multiple boards, uh, including the Middle East Broadcasting Corporation. He has a bachelor's from Princeton, and he has a degree from the Harvard <coughs> Business School. And finally, uh, Mr. Abdulaziz Al-Fahad, uh, a lawyer uh, in corporate, uh, with a uh, focus on corporate banking, uh, at, along with many other areas. He is a fellow uh, in, or was a fellow in the Harvard Center for Middle Eastern Studies. He has a law degree from Yale, and he has a master's from John Hopkins. With that, let me turn the program over to Dr. Mohammed. Thank you very much. Mr. Lee, and good morning, uh, colleagues, good morning, Excellencies and uh, Princes. Uh, my talk uh, today is about the challenges that are facing Saudi Arabia. But let me start by saying that the Saudi oil policy has been consistent in the last 40 and 50 years. It is always calling for a moderate prices and it was and continue to be uh, dependable, reliable and secure uh, oil supplier. Having said that, I think Saudi Arabia has been acknowledged <coughs> to be a very responsible producer in the world. And not only that, but also its role in, in OPEC was really appreciated by bringing those price hawks to the middle ground where a compromise was, was achieved uh, in several OPEC meetings and uh, 
this has uh, been one of the major achievements within OPEC. However, as uh, our chairperson indicated, Saudi Arabia is facing, is facing a lot of challenges. Uh, the first challenge that I would consider is the changing energy world, the energy revolution that we are facing. There is a huge structural change in the energy market. There has been changes that of lasting effects and they may not be reversible as prices go down. Changes is on the supply side and also on the demand <coughs> side. High oil prices for the last few years encourage more energy efficiency measures to be taken, more switching to other sources of energy, and we see that the share, the share of oil in the energy mix is being declining over time. And now it is about 30-32% of the total energy mix compared to more than 40% just 10 years ago. So this is a real change. And for uh, the supply side, we have seen an increasing, because of the new technologies, we, just five years ago, nobody was talking about the shale gas and shale oil. Now, this is a very serious matter. Uh, and we have seen the reports that uh, the United States is going to be uh, somehow the largest uh, oil producer uh, in the world. This is not something that we are worried about since uh, the first producer or largest producer or second largest producer, doesn't matter as long as Saudi Arabia can sell its oil. And it has been before the 60s that the U.S. was the largest producer. Uh, this may, I mean, will not affect. The only effect that we, 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 will, we will face as Saudi Arabia as oil producer is when United States achieve energy independency or oil independency and by saying that I mean that the US will not uh, by 2025 as been indicated by several statistics from IAA and others by 2025 the US may achieve energy independence that means that they will not import, import any barrel of uh, oil uh, from any part of the world. That means that uh, there is going to be at least six million barrels per day that will be lost for good. And we all know that OECD uh, demand for oil uh, has reached its peak in 2008 and it started to decline since then. Of course, the, the economic uh, recession uh, in the, uh, the, uh, in the uh, industrialized world uh, was a major uh, element in trying to mask this kind of decline, as been said by uh, the, you know, I mean the, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, author of the book, The Prize, uh, Daniel Jurgens, that uh, because of the economic slowdown, Nobody had, has noticed that the demand from OECD countries for oil start, I mean, reached its peak and started declining since 2008. And there has been more than 2 million barrels per day that are lost for good because of, the, because of this uh, decline. Uh, at the same time, of course, uh, what is keeping demand for oil growing is basically uh, the demand for oil from the emerging economies, uh, China, India, Brazil, uh, South Africa, etc. But these countries, even though there is growing demand, but it will grow at a very, I mean, 
at a slower rate gradually because they are also adopting energy efficiency policies and they are switching to renewables and they are not repeating the mistakes of the industrialized countries in the past. So each unit of their GDP is using less oil, less energy than what we have thought at the beginning that, you know, because of the, their economic development, uh, urbanization, uh, then uh, there is no control on the demand for oil and they will continue to grow forever. This is not the case. So, and that is why we have seen some studies that shows that the demand for oil will peak. The, the world demand, the international demand for oil, the world demand for oil will peak by 2020. And that is a little bit scary because uh, we thought that, you know, whatever decline in the demand for oil from OECD countries will be greatly compensated and even surpass this decline by the demand, the increasing demand for oil uh, from the emerging economies. So having said that, I think we need to be looking differently now at the new landscaping. We see that the, uh, there are some producers, for example, of uh, the uh, oil, shell oil and shell gas, that we have not thought that they will be producers, such as Australia. Australia, of course, is a major coal producer, but we have never thought that they will be a shale gas and shale oil producer. Uh, Argentina, China, etc. And also we have noticed that Saudi Arabia lately announced that uh, its estimates of shale gas is around 660 trillion uh, cubic feet and that that is just below uh, the United States of 870 uh, trillion cubic feet and Saudi Arabia will be among the top five producer of the uh, uh, owner of the large of the reserve of shale gas. However, I think the only problem or the major problem that will face Saudi Arabia with regard to producing shale gas is uh, the fresh water. And this is a very serious problem. But given that there is a technology that is being under, I mean, development. Uh, which is the um, technology of dry fracking, then if this technology comes to be uh, on a commercial level, then definitely uh, Saudi Arabia will utilize this, this technology and one of, of the major problems will be solved. Uh, the second point that uh, you raised, uh, Mr. Chairman, with regard to the domestic energy consumption in Saudi Arabia, uh, you are absolutely right. Uh, as a matter of fact, Saudi Arabia is consuming <coughs> 4 million barrels of oil equivalent daily, and that is huge amount of oil and gas that we are consuming domestically. Not only that, but the uh, the uh, the increasing or the the the, the rate of uh, increase in demand for uh, energy in Saudi Arabia is about 7% annually. And this is very high also level. Uh, there are some studies that shows when Saudi Arabia may turn into importing oil. I, I don't subscribe to such reports. I think this is only true if Saudi Arabia doesn't do anything with regard to uh, its uh, oil consumption, uh, oil and gas consumption. But Saudi Arabia has already embarked on uh, the following, uh, not only uh, measures to uh, have energy efficiency uh, to be put in place, but, but also on the supply side, uh, Saudi Arabia is embarking on uh, the following uh, renewable energies, uh, in particular uh, solar energy, Side, I mean, along with the nuclear energy. And I think this is a major shift in the Saudi uh, oil and uh, Saudi energy policy that will try to ease 
the, uh, the uh, supply uh, problem that we are facing and also to replace these renewables, including, of course, gas is not renewable, but including natural gas. Uh, we have, as uh, been announced lately, discovered a new amount of natural gas that will bring uh, our total reserve of conventional natural gas to around 300 uh, trillion cubic feet. Uh, this, this number is uh, very relieving lately, and if we add to it, if it comes on a stream, the shale gas, then gradually the pressure will be reduced, and they may also reduce the pressure on us to produce uh, costly renewable energy, such as nuclear. Uh, having said that, I think also on the, uh, the problem we are facing in Saudi Arabia as far as the demand is prices. And uh, price of fuel being subsidized, uh, annual subsidy that we are giving to the uh, uh, energy sector is about 162 billion riyals, around 45 uh, billion dollars annually. And that is huge amount of money. And uh, even though it is very sensitive now nowadays to talk about removing subsidies, but I think gradually it should come. And uh, phasing out these subsidies over a period of time and taking into consideration how to compensate those who are going to be affected, greatly affected, I think this, this should be the kind of policy that we need to implement. It is true that uh, now the subsidy being benefiting the rich people, benefiting the, uh, the uh, expatriate, benefiting everybody. So if you want to direct this subsidy to, be, to benefit those low-income people, then you can do it not in a, in a way of uh, fuel subsidy, but in different ways. And we can benefit from the uh, uh, good practices of the different uh, countries as far as renewable, I mean, as far as removing uh, energy subsidy, fuel subsidy. Uh, also, with regard to the gas, we need to be careful if we adjust the gas prices domestically. Now, the uh, industry is getting the gas prices at 75 cents for each uh, million BTU. Uh, this may not continue to be at the same price, but adjusting this price should take into account the low gas prices in the United States, which is around $4 for each million BTU. So you do want to impact the competitiveness of your petrochemicals. Our petrochemicals being an established uh, industry, and it has very bright and long uh, history of success. And now they are worried about changing the price of gas that may affect their competitiveness. So I think policymakers in Saudi Arabia need to take needs to take that into <coughs> into full account. The last point that you raised, uh, Mr. Chairman, is with regard to the uh, the break-even uh, point for the budget. Because of the increasing expenditure in Saudi Arabia, we are facing a problem now that the break-even point for the Saudi budget is about 80 to 90 dollars per barrel. So any international oil price below that means that either you reduce your, your expenditure or that you will face uh, deficit in the budget that you need to, of course, in the short term, you can compensate that or you can cover this, these shortages by drawing on your uh, reserves in the, uh, I mean, total reserve, which is about $850 billion uh, being invested outside the country. But gradually, if we continue with that level, high level of expenditure, Definitely, we may face the same problem we faced in the 80s uh, when uh, prices went below uh, $8 uh, in 1986 and then gradually recovered, but 
not more than $20 per barrel. And then we have seen that Saudi Arabia borrowed domestically, and uh, which amount to, uh, I mean, we have seen that the, <coughs> the public debt increased to a level that was not acceptable internationally. We don't want to repeat this, so we need to m maintain a balance. Definitely nobody is, is asking that we reduce consumption to a very low level, but definitely we need to rationalize these consumptions and concentrate on the uh, capital investment and in removing any bottlenecks in the uh, infrastructure uh, anywhere uh, in the kingdom and try to move the country toward diversification, which is very important. The main question that face, all, all Saudis are thinking of this question. Can we reduce our dependency on oil revenues before the world reduce its dependency on imported oil? This is a very valid and very important question. We have been talking about uh, diversification since the 70s but we have achieved a lot in spite of huge programs and of huge investment in different sectors. But I think, I think we need to be very selective as far as how to move into the knowledge economy and how to turn Saudi nationals into a creative. I see here uh, many Saudis here who are very intellectual. Those who will go back to the country they are going to be creative. They are going to, to shoulder the economic development of the country. But we need, we need to do that faster. And we need to see what kind of opportunities that we have. We have a young generation. We have a young population. But we can turn this. This is not a risk. It is, we can turn it into opportunity. And we can benefit Saudi Arabia a lot by investing in the young generation in order to carry through the economic development of the country. Sorry for taking long, but these are basic, basically the main elements that I have in my talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Ali? Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Professor Lee. I was asked to talk about the economic framework that uh, the kingdom is operating in now particularly given what's happening in the region uh, and what is called the Arab Spring. And um, people obviously comment on the fact that the Saudi government last year, um, the king uh, announced in, uh, dramatic increases in spending um, in terms of unemployment benefits and other benefits and in terms of uh, increasing the payroll in the government uh, to address what were perceived as potential uh, social risks that were emanating from, uh, from the Arab Spring. And I think my argument today is going to be that uh, the kingdom faces structural problems, it faces economic structural problems that need to be seriously addressed. However, the, the political environment in the region will make it unlikely that those structural problems will be successfully addressed quickly. However, I think people underestimate the economic wealth that the kingdom has uh, and the fact that actually it may be able to continue to spend its way out of problems for much longer than people think. Uh, and, and, I, and I start that a bit by giving the uh, example of when I left the business school here in 1985, uh, I went back to Riyadh and I joined uh, the central bank SAMA uh, and I joined the, joined the foreign investment department of SAMA in those days. And this was just at the end of the period of high oil prices. So Sama had acquired $150 billion of reserves. Uh, and then the oil price collapsed, as Dr. Mohammed uh, said. And Saudi Arabia entered into an 18-year period until 2003 of deficit spending. Uh, yet despite that, with the, with the $150 billion of reserves, and domestic borrowing, but hardly any international borrowing, uh, the kingdom was able to survive economically until the year 2003. Uh, economic growth was actually not bad. Um, and yes, there were the, the Ministry of Finance uh, invented delayed domestic payments and, and I think caused some damage to the private sector. But at the end of the day, the amount of economic 
disruption from really 20 years nearly of deficit spending was, was quite limited. Uh, and I say that because today uh, the kingdom's reserves are at $700 billion. Uh, and the kingdom is spending $200 plus billion dollars a year. And when we talk about the, the break-even point, we have to remember that the budget is a very wasteful budget. The kingdom is spending uh, a rich man's budget. And, and that budget has a lot of fat in it. So if oil prices dropped, there is a lot of capacity, first of all, to reduce that spending without causing um, dramatic uh, pain, without, without really hitting the pain threshold uh, in society. And uh, in addition, the kingdom has, I mean, you have the reserves. Uh, obviously, it depends on what happens to the oil price, but let's assume the oil price begins to gradually go down. Uh, you also have a capacity to borrow domestically from the banks, and the, and the banking system is very large, very robust, and very liquid. So that before, before you even get to foreign borrowing, which is what the Europeans and everybody else are talking about now, the kingdom has a tremendous capacity to borrow domestically from its banking system. And then, again, something that Saudi Arabia never touched in those 20 years was privatization. Uh, the kingdom owns... I mean, the government owns the oil company 100%. The oil company is a trillion dollar plus asset. Um, if, if, if in desperation one needed to privatize, there's a huge amount of wealth there. Uh, the government owns 60 to 70% of all publicly traded companies um, in the kingdom. So um, it, could, it could start to privatize simply by selling its stock of um, of publicly held companies. And that is before privatizing other, uh, other companies. So I would say that on one side, you have tremendous wealth and tremendous dry powder. On the other side, you have structural problems. Uh, you have 90% cheap foreign labor driving the private sector. You have a Saudi labor force that is really has not been adequately educated or trained um, to, to be productive in the economy, yet it has a very dangerous sense of entitlement. So that it, 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 it's a very difficult job for the Saudi government to reconcile the fact that its labor force is not equipped uh, and that it's relying on, on, on millions and millions of, of, of cheap <coughs> Uh, foreign uh, labor to, to really run a good part of the economy. And addressing that, first of all, is a long-term problem because you have to restructure the educational system. The, doing that involves also dealing with the religious establishment, um, which is, again, not easy. So there, there are some fundamental... Um, obviously, you add to that things that Dr. Mohammed mentioned, like energy subsidies and energy wastage, which is obviously very high, again, also. Um, and, and what the kingdom has been doing, at least in the past couple of years, has been warehousing a lot of the youth uh, in foreign scholarships. Uh, it create, created 300 jobs uh, in the public sector last year. So people who look at it say, well, this is unsustainable. And it is really unsustainable. The question is for how long? And I think uh, if, if one assumed that the Saudi government will behave the way any other uh, politician will behave, and politicians usually behave tactically rather than strategically. Uh, it's going to be, uh, it, it, you would assume that they will, they will delay taking painful uh, steps. Uh, and you would conclude when you look at the numbers that actually they have a lot of dry powder and capacity to continue to delay taking painful steps. So I think the moment of reckoning economically in the kingdom is uh, maybe a couple of decades down the road and much later than people think. Right. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Abdelaziz? I really don't have much to say about energy, so uh, <laughs> I, 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 I will share with you some probably disjointed comments about the uh, impact, either direct or indirect, of that awakening uh, uh, on the Saudi scene. And I want to start by going back to what our colleague said about uh, uh, domestic consumption and subsidies. Uh, 
most people would agree that the policies encouraging domestic consumption and maintaining high levels of domestic subsidies uh, are irrational, economically speaking. And there is no way that's sustainable. And if we take some of these studies seriously, uh, by 2030, Saudi Arabia should be importing oil. Now, we all know that cannot continue, but it's probably a reasonable <coughs> assumption to say, so long as agitation in the Arab streets is taking place, as Ali suggested, politicians are tacticians, and they're not going to touch these sensitive domestic issues uh, until things settle down. Uh, now, when will that be? I don't know. It could be in a year, it could be in 10 years. But can you afford to wait 10 years? Somewhere between one year and 10 years, somebody has to make a decision, and there will be ramifications. Uh, one of the, uh, again, the rational elements in our economic policies is Saudi Arabia understands to be the largest grain importer in the world. We have a desert ecology. It's extremely fragile. And added to that fragility, it has been more or less uh, decimated now because you have these huge, for a desert environment, the huge uh, herds of cattle uh, uh, encouraged to multiply by the cheap grain. Uh, and everybody knows that is not good and something has to be done about it. But again, as a politician, what do you do? If you do the economically rational thing, there will be a lot of unhappy people and you don't want that. Uh, where you strike the balance, I honestly don't know. Uh, the other uh, uh, comment I would, I would share with you is uh, uh, the Arab awakening has been uh, heavily linked to the new social media. And Saudi Arabia is no exception. Uh, actually, if, if we believe the statistics that we see, Saudi Arabia is the highest consumer of YouTube in the world, per capita. Now, there are many reasons for that, one of which is probably uh, the positive uh, of uh, public entertainment uh, in, in, in Saudi Arabia, so people routinely resort to, to the internet and YouTube to, uh, to watch it. There is also some interesting uh, Saudi production of uh, programs uh, by freelancers that are heavily uh, watched. I, I didn't really believe that until I started looking into some of them. And there will be young Saudis doing programs and posting them on YouTube. And within two or three days, you go and check, and there will be a million plus uh, viewers. Uh, that's extraordinary by any measure. What, how does this translate eventually in, in, in socially and politically and economically? I really don't know. But that's something that, that uh, we should watch. Uh, the other element of social media that's affecting Saudi Arabia, again, not directly related to that of awakening, but somehow in parallel with it, is that s slowly there is a public sphere that's being carved out. In Saudi Arabia, typically, uh, uh, most public sphere activities are, 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 are not encouraged. The existence of the social media uh, so far has allowed a virtual organization uh, of civic groups. There are people who, who organized against co uh, around common interests. And it's inter I mean, most of it, I think, is not political. But within that uh, uh, large space, there are obviously uh, political uh, organizing, not organization, but political organizing around common causes. That's something that we also have to watch uh, uh, how it evolves. Uh, a subsidiary issue of this is, is what's going on in Syria. Uh, if you follow Twitter uh, and other social media, it's, it's, it's fascinating how much energy and passion it's generating, uh, uh, which is more or less benign until you remember the Afghan experience and that what starts as a sensible, understandable reaction somehow translates down the road into some nasty manifestations within Saudi Arabia and the larger reason, uh, region. Uh, what used to be to take years and you know a few decades ago could be telescoped now 
basically in, in a few weeks. And that's a challenge that is facing not just the Saudi government, but everybody uh, uh, in the region. Uh, I will leave it at this, and to the extent any of these issues are of interest, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, before I open this up for uh, questions from the audience, I'd like to pose one, um, which is um, when I was a grad student, uh, I won't tell you how many years ago that was, um, I was in the Middle East Center here, and um, we had a uh, speaker from Saudi Arabia, a man named Hedi Tahir, and he told us about the need for Saudi Arabia to develop an off-oil uh, industrial policy. Um, I have been to, I think, five such talks over the last 35 years, uh, and each time they talk about we are on the verge of, we're going to embark on a new policy to get Saudi Arabia to diversify its industrial structure. Uh, and you get look at the fact that whether world oil demand peaks in 2020 or 2030, it will peak sometime. Uh, you have an exceptionally large population of people under the age of 20 in Saudi Arabia. Uh, and you exist in a world that is becoming uh, increasingly uh, restless, uh, whether it's Iraq or Egypt or Iran or Syria. Um, and therefore, the imperative of moving towards a more diversified industrial structure becomes uh, even more paramount. And yet, it's really difficult to do that, uh, given the length of time we, you've been working at it. And I wondered, what are the prospects and what changes need to be made if Saudi Arabia is to diversify its economy? Thank you, Lee. I can't figure out uh, when, where, what time you were studying here. <laughs> well, you're not going to help. <laughs> well, it is about 40 years ago. <laughs> this is when we started the first uh, economic uh, development plan yeah. uh, in 1970. <laughs> Probably you were young at that time, but anyway. <laughs> I might have been graduating. <laughs> <laughs> but in all cases, I, you, you posed a very important question. I think we've been talking a lot about economic diversification, but very little has happened. We all thought that with the establishment of the Supreme Economic Council, which I consider as a kitchen for economic diversification, we thought that this will gradually will speed up the economic diversification process. Unfortunately, uh, the uh, Council tend to be more of a bureaucratic body than an efficient implementing uh, body for economic diversification. Uh, these days, there is more serious, more seriousness with regard to economic diversification because everybody, as I said, is talking about it, especially with the huge structural change that is happening in the in the energy market. Uh, there is the, the Ministry of Economic and Planning, uh, Economy and Planning, uh, economic, Economy and Planning, is planning to implement the strategy of transforming Saudi Arabia into a knowledge society, into a knowledge economy, where, as I said, uh, the Saudi individual is at the heart of this strategy. How to concentrate of a better quality education, how uh, to train people, uh, how to, to move the whole economy toward, you know, there are several successful examples around the world. South Korea, for example, they don't have any natural resources or very limited natural resource base, but they concentrated on a knowledge economy. And we have seen how South Korea is, is doing as far as economic development, as far as the uh, succeeding in competing uh, uh, with regard to the uh, knowledge economy. So I think this is a golden opportunity. We have the financial capability. We have a leadership that is totally uh, aware of the need 
to move ahead very quickly. So I think we need, with the cooperation and coordination of the different agencies, to move ahead. Industry is another example, but industry, uh, we started with petrochemicals, and we have succeeded with petrochemicals. But still, if you don't have the qualified people, whatever investment you do as far as uh, uh, industry, uh, other sector, service sector, if you don't have the qualified Saudis, you will end up importing skilled labor and semi-skilled labor from outside. And this will exaggerate the, the problem of unemployment, which is now about uh, 12 or 15 percent. This is very huge for a young society, and it will even increase if we don't have job creation over time. So I think uh, the awareness is much better, as Dr. Abdelaziz said. The social media is putting a lot of pressure. If we talk about NGO in Saudi Arabia, it is the social media. It is putting a lot of pressure on the government to move ahead, in a very constructive way, of course, to move ahead, because whatever we are doing now is not sustainable. We need to change that. We need to change the mentality. We need to improve on the government bureaucracy, etc. It's a long list of, of reform. So I think, I think, hopefully, within the coming 10 years that Saudi Arabia will be changing in a much better economic environment that will allow for reducing dependency on the oil revenue. Thank you. Sure. I mean, I would, I would maybe put it um, slightly differently. I think it is very difficult to restructure the Saudi economy away from oil. And it's very difficult to restructure your economy under any circumstances, unless you're in a crisis. I mean, America didn't start to look at its financial sector till it collapsed a few years ago. So the difference between being uh, sort of academically aware that you need to diversify away from oil and taking those practical steps is a very difficult one. And uh, I think the kingdom in the early 1970s took some very intelligent steps which were to diversify within the oil space. In other words, to, to, to invest in petrochemicals, as Dr. Mohammed said, which allowed them to capture a higher element of the overall value creation associated with oil. And actually, that has been extremely successful. It's not only been extremely successful in terms of uh, the, the market share that the kingdom has acquired through SABIC and the industrial cities, but it's been extremely successful in human development. In other words, uh, the Saudi educational system, uh, despite its many failures, uh, has been able to produce engineers. Uh, and, and, the, and, the oil, and because the oil company had a, had a successful history, Aramco had a successful history of human development, they were able to transfer that over to the, uh, the petrochemical sector. So in that sense, the petro <coughs> petrochemical sector has been one of the most successful diversification projects because not only did it um, uh, have a business value, but it also had a human development uh, angle to it. Having said that, going beyond that is going to be very difficult unless a crisis happens. And, and, and the point that I was trying to make is that really, before you get to the pain threshold, there's a huge amount of wealth there. And, you know, I was looking at Greece the other day, and, and Greece, uh, the Greeks were selling their London embassy to generate... Um, uh, to generate foreign exchange reserves. It's going to be a long time before we have to sell uh, the embassy in London uh, to, to generate foreign exchange reserves. That, that, there is so much, uh, you know, wealth be even below the obvious that, that uh, it's, you're going to have to expect the Saudi government to be, uh, you know, a strategic thinker beyond what all other politicians would be. To, to, to take the painful steps that it would have to take, and, and that's going to be a long time. Uh, if I could just interject one thing, though, is you're looking at a, a growing population uh, of people who do not have university education, uh, and as long as your birth rate is in the vicinity of 3% per year, uh, you've, that population is going to continue to expand, and, uh, and you have to have some type of strategy of what 
10 years, 20 years, 30 years from now, you're going to say to that population? Well, actually, you, you have a, a growing population that has a university <coughs> education, and I think and that, I, that, that is more of a problem than not having, because one of the problems that has happened in Saudi Arabia <laughs> is that the university education has been expanding so quickly as to absorb tens of thousands of students into getting a mediocre education. So it's more dangerous, really, when the students get an, a mediocre education because they graduate with a sense of expectation. Um, and I think that what the government has been doing, really, has been warehousing them so far um, in, 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 in the public sector, trying to pressure the private sector to hire them. Uh, and that's going to continue uh, to, to, to start to retrain and re-educate and change the educational system is a long-term process. And that, um, you know, it's, it's going to take a crisis to, to, um, to start that. But you are absolutely right. That there is a dropout uh, before the university. And those students or those young people cannot find a job because they are uh, lacking any skills. So now there is a huge training program in Saudi Arabia for such kind of people. And I think uh, gradually we will absorb them, given that there is uh, opportunities in the labor market to absorb those uh, those kind of people. But I agree with uh, with, uh, with Ali that uh, you don't need that many uh, to have the university education. So you need to create the alternatives, and that is still lagging. Thank you. Thank you. By the way, it's 2.3, the population okay. growth rate, okay. and collapsing. <laughs> collapsing. All right. I would like to ask all of you to please join me in thanking this terrific panel.